preparing to live stream on Facebook. For those of you on the Zoom, patiently waiting. Okay, hi everybody. It looks like we're live on Facebook. All right, so hello everybody and welcome to this, our special seventh bonus lesson for summer 2021 uh, writing challenge here at Academic Writers Unblock and Academic Writers Summer 2021 Support Circle. Um, you may know me already. I am Sharon or Dr. Sharon Chahaf, founder of Academic Writers Unblock, and I am so happy and uh, honored to, uh, you know, be with you know you guys today and uh, to bring to completion what has been for me a really exciting um, week. Well, it became two weeks almost of of. Uh, engaging um, and uh, hearing from you guys and understanding where, you know, things get stuck for you and continuing to help detoxifying the academic writing culture. So today we had um, a vote running on the group and on the, both academic writers on block and on um, uh, academic writing support circle. Um, and uh, actually we kind of, we're kind of tied and the vote for, uh, was for the topic of today. And so we were kind of tied between uh, talking about craft and getting a draft finished and, um, and between time management and managing your time. But here's the good news. Uh, I decided to do a more free flowing conversational, well, I'm always free flowing and conversational, but you know, even more free flowing and conversational um, presentation today. I'm gonna be jumping a little bit be between the PowerPoints uh, for two lessons from my workshop, right? So I have the lesson that's called part uh, time, part two, the project schedule. Um, and that was the, the first choice that many people voted for. And then there's the one for craft, which was the second choice. So instead of, um, you know, disappointing some people and, uh, and not others, I will, it, at the risk of being a little bit, you know, messy, um, I think we can just merge the two topics because really, honestly, you will see that um, uh, in my curriculum, these two issues are completely inter intertwined because, and in a minute, we'll talk about this in a more organized way, but the only way to uh, get a project from start to finish, right, that, that the crafts person or the craftsman or the craft women's job, right, is to learn how to work at their writing. And the medium for us to work at our writing is time. We work through time, we work with time. So on day, uh, gosh, I want to say three and four of the challenge, we talked about shifting our par paradigm around time and understanding how to dance with time and, and you know understand our own sense of rhythm and our own natural timing and not to try to force too much ourselves to work against what is correct for us. Um, and so, Again, yeah, the issue of uh, learning the stages that we've talked about in, uh, you know, all, uh, all across. I, I can remember what we did each day. What we did talk about the stages of the writing process, um, those stages occur over time. And so we can bring together the idea of craft, which we will explore a little bit together, and we can uh, bring this together with the questions of how do we organize ourselves over time. And it's not a stretch. This is to begin with, uh, those are uh, interlinked issues. All right, so before we start, we just have one more announcement to make. So I'm really excited and I'm sorry, uh, today we're running a little bit late because of technical um, issues and some of it is because I um, uh, am very, very, very excited to uh, again announce um, the accelerated workshop. So uh, July, we, are, we have two programs this summer in Academic Writers Unblock. And one is the uh, deep dive week long retreat. It's a really intense one week retreat. Um, and I've talked about that before, and you can go back and watch the videos if you're interested in doing that's July 11th through July 16th. And it's, you know, a week long, uh, you get through it in a week, kind of deep dive. It's also fun, uh, obviously, and, and, you know, all of these good stuff. Go check it out if this is for you. Um, and this one, the early, the early bird special ends today. Um, although, if, you know, if you're watching this within the next 48 hours and you want to do the retreat, 
you know, talk to me about the early bird special. And that's 13, right? $1,350 for the early bird special. Um, that's an intense kind of big dive. Um, and so that, you know, the pricing for a retreat is, is as such. But now for just, uh, what did we say? Two forty nine for just two forty nine, two hundred forty nine dollars. Which is, I'm very excited about being able to offer this. Um, this is the, the the cheapest that I was ever able to uh, offer uh, one of my workshops. You get, you can get the full uh, signature academic writers unlock workshop over four weeks uh, in July, and it's an accelerate program. It's designed to ask the minimum uh, of you both in terms of, you know, your time investment and your money investment, I kind of try to envision what can I do over one month that can allow somebody that's already writing and has deadlines to engage in, you know, uh, clarifying, detoxifying, re-imagining their writing practice and do it as they are making progress along a project. So, Check out the, uh, now the link is live. It's on the group. It's everywhere. I'm going to put it on the comments in the live. I'm, if you're on Facebook, uh, sorry, if you're watching this on YouTube later, um, I'm going to put the link for that also on the YouTube. And of course, if you're on YouTube, subscribe and like. Um, it's four weeks. You have, uh, you know, you're getting one or two short pre-recorded lessons on Monday. And then Friday, you have a one hour workshop with me. And you have throughout the week to watch the pre-recorded lessons, to read the readings. If you want to, you're getting, you know, re- you're getting everything that you always get in my workshops. You're getting the readings, the pre-recorded lessons, uh, the live workshop, the Facebook uh, community that's just for class attendees. Um, that is really, I, I think it's one of the most fantastic things that happen on those workshops is the community that happens on those uh, class work. Um, uh, groups because people, you know, co-write together and they help each other. And I see, you know, I can be asleep in the middle of the night, but people are talking to each other and helping each other. Um, so all of that and more. And now for just 249, did I say that already? Okay. You might not think that I hate to sell, but I do hate to sell, but I am excited about uh, the products. So with that said, let us begin. So today we are going up. Oh, I don't want to stop the live stream. I want to start the sharing. Uh, let's let's jump first to the uh, to the craft. So this is day seven bonus challenge. I'm sorry I didn't make a nice little uh, slide for that. As I said today, it was like all over the place. So we're going to talk a little bit about craft, uh, practice style, and structure. Uh, so I recommend. You know, I always start with recommending um, the books I work with. So for thinking about craft, one of the books I really like is called Writing with Quiet Hands. And again, I'm going to put the link later. Uh, so Writing with Quiet quiet Hands, How to Shape Your Writing to Resonate with Readers by Paula Munir. And she's a, you know, a writer, an author, an editor, I think even an agent. Um, again, this is not from the world of academia. These are uh, books that are in the um, wider um, writerly world. Another one that I really want to recommend when you think about craft, especially from the paradigm that, you know, that um, the paradigm shift that I am proposing is influenced a lot by this fantastic book uh, from Luis de Salvo, and it's called The Art of Slow Writing. I feel like I must have recommended that before. It is such a fantastic book, and it has a lot of really hands-on advice for your actual craft, and it has a really good title that I stole for one of my weeks in my workshop because I love to be influenced by my favorite writing goddesses and Louise de Salvo is one of them. And I think that it's from her, that title goes, learn to work at your writing. Learn to work at your writing. I feel like that is such a big part of craft. Um, so let me start with, uh, so these are the two books. Uh, when we will talk about time, oh, sorry. So that's the third book. We will uh, try to get to this, but if we don't get to this, get this book, work with this book, uh, A Writer's Time by Kenneth Atchity, uh, a guide to the creative process from vision through revision. This is such a fantastic book that really, uh, you know, it's so hands-on. Um, it has a theory about writing that that's very much aligned with the kind of uh, theories I like, you know, all the Victoria Nelson stuff we did early on and uh, understanding the conscious and the subconscious parts of writing. And then he goes into very hands-on and he even has like he's, he has one of those book in a year agendas. We might, I have it on the, on the PowerPoint, so maybe we will see. So those are really 
good friends of yours if you want to learn about time and you want to learn about craft. And I'm sure I have more that I can think of, but we're, we're going to stop with this. All right. So from uh, writing with quiet hands, I want to start with this quote from Ernest Hemingway. We all know, we don't need to introduce the author Ernest Hemingway, right? And um, I love this quote. It says, we are all apprentices in a craft where no one ever becomes a master. And, you know, this comes from Hemingway after he was wildly accepted as uh, wildly and widely accepted as a master. So I love um, inviting people who are in academia, who tend to be so hard on themselves for not being in mastery of the academic style that is one of the hardest styles of writing in existence because we have to do, I talked about it before, right? We do storytelling, we do data analysis, we do reporting on context, you know, social, political, et cetera, context. Uh, we have to explain the literature that came before us and position ourselves. We have to do argumentation, right? Rhetoric. And we, what else am I missing? Uh, right? So reporting, oh, and theory building. On top of it all, we are expected to also, you know, do very abstract universalizations and theoretical constructions. So, you know, academic writing is bringing all of this together, but we are so hard on ourselves, right? And we're like beating ourselves up for not being the masters of our craft. Um, so I like to start with this thing from Hemingway to let you know that being a master means you are willing to continue and work on your mastery. So when I talk about craft, uh, and you know what I want to do right now is tease out the meanings for you. Um, but I want to focus a little bit on the secret, you know, craft as the secret of execution, right? Remember when we talked about style, we said there's the uh, how you say something, and that's right. There's the what you want to say, and then there's the how you're going to say it. How you're going to say it, that's the style. Um, so with craft, it's uh, again, I have a couple of provocations here, so I'm going to go through it real fast because I want to get to the time part as well, right? So talent isn't everything and talent isn't even enough because for you to get skill and mastery, talent has to be developed through practice, right? The verb to practice and practice and practice. And it needs to be developed also into the noun practice, right? Where you have a writing practice, where you spend some time to cultivate your writing practice Think about your writing practice, um, build your writing practice, think about the space for your writing uh, practice. So you see, I'm doing a little bit of a recap of everything we've done so far, right? You think about the space, you think about your time and energy needs. Remember, we did that in uh, day, some, some day last week, I think day four uh, or three, we talked about your time, energy, your time needs. All of this goes into having a practice. And so when I talk about craft, it, it pertains to all these things. It also pertains to having boundaries, right? Remember I told you when we talked about time, right now I'm online, you know, my kids are at home for uh, summer break. They're not coming through my door. They know I'm live on Facebook right now, but, you know, I wish I could tell you that I, I don't have, you know, the same thing, but I will tell you, you know, when it's my writing time, it's a little harder to keep them out the door, right? Unless I make the commitment for my craft and I set up the writing times in a way where they know it's as important as the time when I am teaching or going online, right? So for you, think about it. When you're in class teaching, you know, your mom can't call you with something urgent, even if it's urgent, right? And if she would call you, you will not be answering because you're teaching. So the same thing about your writing. Okay. Uh, practice makes perfect. You know, cliches are important because they always have a very uh, important grain of truth. So this is, and again, you know how much emphasis I put on the language we use around our writing. So I want us to move from this idea that I'm going to avoid it until last minute. And then I'm going to like, you know, just get through the panic and write quick. That's not how the craft person works, right? The person that has a craft has a routine, and it's not an emotionally dramatic routine. All right, you know all these things already if you've been following. Um, and one last word of uh, caution, well, not one, two, but the um, I want to talk about skill and talent versus the individual creative sparks. I'm actually going to stop for that because this is important. I want to look you guys in the eyes and say, it's very important not to forget that the creative spark, you know, that thing that flows through you, that 
I still believe does not have, you know, it has its own timing. You cannot really control it. So when we talk about creating a practice and being at your desk, you know, there was, I don't remember the, the writer who said, yes, I absolutely believe in the muse and it is fickle, but I wait for the muse at 5 a.m. at my desk. So it knows I'm there, right? So there's this tension. And the warning I want to give you is don't let the practice side, you know, take the joy out of the creative side. So, you know, this is why we do process activities. This is why we do, um, you know, all of these things uh, that are about learning to be playful around our work so that, yes, we do have a practice and we are regular and we are there when we have to be there, but we do not, um, you know, with that, we don't use too much discipline and kill the creative spark within. So don't let your craft be the enemy of your creativity. Be let it be the servant of your creativity. That that is, if you are setting up times to work, remember that some of that work can be process time. And if it's the right, if it's not the right stage for you uh, to be doing this, don't kick yourself. Right, sit there and do something creative and doodle and think and listen to music, but know that you're doing process activities and this is just as much a part of your craft as it is to start drafting. All right. So you guys knew I was going to do a little bit more of this before we go on. Um, so yeah, that's the bottom line here. Develop tolerance and patience for the process involved in crafting. So here's a, a couple more quotes, right? So this is a very famous one also from the Munir book, but she's quoting other people. You know, there's this saying that you need 10,000 hours or 1 million words before you can, you know, master your writing. Um, so all right, I'm just going to jump right through this. All right. So I would have you write. And if you're watching this on Facebook, you can, you know, later you can pause and write a little bit, you know, Again, if we had the workbook for the bonus lesson, this would be on the, on the workbook. This would be an invitation for you to stop and explore and write about the word itself, the word craft, what it means to you and how it applies to your writing. So again, because we're doing this fast today, I'm not going to ask people to write this. And, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, I'll see if somebody wants to write this in the um, comments on Facebook, but I'm not going to, you know push the point, but if you can take the time, take a minute and think about what did, does it say to you when you think about craft? So again, if you're in the chat here and you wanna write, it's fine. And if not, that's also fine. And I mean, I can tell you uh, the, the answers that, I mean, we, I just actually taught this in my uh, spring workshop that just got, uh, we just finished Friday and I can't believe that this workshop is no is, is done. Um, and actually one of my, well, they're all brilliant and I love them all, but one of my brilliant students, uh, and, and again, all of them were, uh, mentioned a quote from Toni Morrison uh, oh, good. I'm having more comments down here. So I'm going to write. This. So, so when I, I had them do the same exercise and she talked about reading a piece from Toni Morrison, the author, and she, the Toni, Toni Morrison in this piece went back and explained um, her choice of words and the different choices that she made in the first sentence of each of her novels or several of her novels and how she, and, you know, and she went into how you know, changing just one word, um, you know, means so much. And all the choices that were made around just the word selection for the first sentence for her novel. And I really loved that that was invoked. Um, however, it's also you immediately, uh, you can see how this can become very blocking, right? So this idea of craft is, you know, this patient, fine comb, like fine tooth comb kind of going through, uh, and polishing your work, I really want you guys to try to keep that stage for the uh, you know end part of your writing stage because it's it's most academic writers if they start trying to get that first paragraph just right and they polish it and polish it and polish it, I seriously think that you know most academic writers spend. 90% of their time working on the first paragraph or the introduction for a piece, 
And so then the 10% of the time to write the rest of the piece. And the reason we do that, that's our perfectionism, right? So again, don't confuse, right? So when Toni Morrison talks about making those really, really fine choices, I bet you she's talking about something that happens in the last draft. So this is going to be our main takeaway when we talk about craft today, is that you have to understand that craft, you know, is different. What you need to do for your craft changes across time, right? So I'm bringing together craft and time. So I want to talk about, you know what, let me just jump right now into the time one and see if I have it. Let me see. Sorry. It's going to be a little interesting to go back and forth between these two PowerPoints. So let me see. Oh, no, that's not the one I want. All right. Hang on. Sorry. I'll stop sharing. Um, All right. So I'm not going to even share. I'm just going to talk through this one. So um, I want to talk about um, this differentiation and this is actually from the kind of agity and he talks about three to- three periods of time when you work on a project it's really really complicated not complicated he talks about beginning time middle time and end time right the end time is upon us right so all of you I think know about end time I think most of us really begin to write stuff when we are at the end end time end time has this momentum right you're like this is when you have to finish or you know you are finishing the deadline is here or you're one of the lucky few that you know can self-impose deadlines and and you're ready um beginning time right is when you just initially begin a project so he talks about the different the attending difficulties and the attending um uh advantages right so when you have when you're in beginning time you're excited you have this like new passion about your topic you are ready to sit there forever and just immerse yourself because it's new and it's exciting right but it's also very confusing you don't know you don't have enough to know where this is going so it's very anxious it's very frightened so this is beginning time middle time Middle time is hard. Middle time is where most of us suffer the most, I think. Um, Although end time is probably where we get the most burnt out. Middle time is this like drudge in the middle. Like you already have and you know, it's like you have the prospectus and you maybe wrote a chapter, your your introduction, and now you have to get into chapter two and chapter three and chapter four. And it's like this, oh my God, there is so much more to go. And where do I bring the energy, right? I no longer have this early energy and I don't yet have the end time energy. And so it's very important to think about those stages of a project, right? So you guys are seeing, I'm bringing together the craft question with the timing question. So when we think about a bigger project, where we want to plan and we want to allow, you know, first time to be like beginning time to be beginning time and middle time to be middle time and end time to be the end time. If you do the work in in the beginning, and you do the work in the middle, then end time is going to go a lot smoother, right? Because you're ready then to do the, you know, the intense many hours and polishing and all that kind of stuff that comes at the end. So we'll talk about this more specifically about the stages, but I do want to look at the chat because there were participation. Um, it is how, it is how, so I asked about what the word craft means and Levet is saying it is how you complete the task it includes your style and flavor. Good, you're absolutely right. So you're bringing up, uh, right? So this this comment is bringing up the the style part of it, right? So this idea, yeah, that's that's actually very compatible with the Toni Morrison um, uh, quote, right? Because it's like this idea that you hone your voice, you hone your style, and this is a very concrete. So let's talk about this just a little bit, okay? About what that means, craft. One of my students also in the spring workshop, when I talked, we talked about craft said, I never believed or I didn't think that academic writing should be stylish or it should be beautiful. I didn't think I had the luxury, you know, to make it beautiful or to make it compelling or to make it about my voice or to make it about my story. So that's a big belief that we carry around academic writing. And partly, guys, it's because how we handle time, because if you've been avoiding and then you like try to get beginning, middle and end time happening all over the last week before something is due at the publisher or whatever. Right. Or at your advisor, um, you know, your thesis advisor, then, of course, you don't really have time to go through the stages of making something crude and then like refining it 
uh, editing it, you know, distilling it, and then the fine last polish, which I really beg you, keep it to the last part, right? So I think a lot of time what happens is we have a really nice beginning because we spent way too much time stuck on getting that first paragraph perfect. Um, and then, you know, we cram all those, you know, all those stages into end time. So what I suggest in my takeaway, and again, today is kind of short and sweet and more of an inspiration, right? Is how do you plan, you know, for those different stages? So first of all, you when you start um, engaging in planning, period, right? So we've done earlier in the challenge, we've planned our week. So the same kind of tools apply. You can do a monthly plan. You can do a semester plan if you're still at school, right? Or a faculty, you know, if you're in an academic institution, the semester plan could be a really good friend of yours, you know, and then you should do an annual plan, right? So when you do that kind of planning, you do the same. So again, going back to time, you do the same things we did for the week. Remember what we did for the week? I bet you do, right? We started by blocking out our commitments. So you do the same thing for the year. And let me say this, and I'm actually stealing this from the HD, uh, but you know, other places as well. Start by blocking out vacation time. Set up vacation times and then set up your semesters. You know, I would do like the semester, I would know that the, the teaching days, I would block those out. Like in the bigger, um, in the bigger schedule for the year, I would completely block out the, the teaching days. You can block out, you know, if you know that you teach Tuesday and Thursday and have faculty meetings on Friday, block those out and then block all holidays, all the time when you don't have childcare, block that shit, just block it. Then you can take a look at your year and you know what you can do? You can count the number of writing days that you're going to have in the year. Now take that number and cut it by 50%. <laughs> if you found that you have, you know, 100 writing days, trust that it's going to be 50. Now, when you know you have 50, and, you know, that might be a small number, right? Depending on what else, you know, you have in life. But if you have 50 writing days, even if you have 25 writing days, you can make a progress on a project. But, right, so the difference is, the difference is Taking that bird's eye view. Now, if you have a dissertation and you know you have four years, you can do, uh, you know, what is your four-year schedule like? What is your five-year schedule like? So you start by blocking out the time and then you, then you think through your goals, right? So you block out the time and you can basically get to the number of days that you, you're going to have. What that does to you is that it really is a sobering, like, if, I, if this is a writing day and I have only 50 <laughs> am I going to write or you know what's 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 it gonna be all right so um now I see that I didn't even record so hopefully I it, well I always do it from the Facebook live so that's interesting but uh hopefully there I'll, I'll record now but hopefully the uh recording on Facebook live is good enough and because we don't, now don't have redundancy yay all right so back to craft so let's uh, jump back into the craft uh, presentation because I want to jump, right? Um, okay, so here's another one. Oh my God, I'm giving you guys so much, but that's okay. Am I sharing this? Is this, uh, no, hang on. Let me make sure I'm sharing it in the right way. All right, here we are. Can you see this if you are on Zoom? Yes. Oh, fantastic, all right. So here's another quick thing that I want to mention. Uh, I want to talk about the difference between pensters and plotters. Have you ever heard about that? And if you've not, I think that that's also mentioned in the Munir, but also in the Achidi. It's a really good, right? So there's the people, penster, it comes from the word pen, right? And plotters, it's like you outline and you plot. So the people who really tend to start with an outline and have a carefully outlined thing for the whole chapter or the whole dissertation or the whole book or whatever it is, Versus the people that just want to throw themselves in and start writing, right? Now, of course, you know what I'm going to say. A, know who you are. Are you a penster or are you a plotter? You know who you are. But then, of course, my recommendation is to bring into your practice the good of both worlds, right? So if you know that you are a, a, a plotter and you know that you like to have an outline, Think about what is the limitation of that. The limitation of that is that sometimes it's harder for you to pivot 
when you start writing and the writing takes you away from your outline, correct? Right? That happens a lot. Um, if you were some, and then what do you do? Are you willing to abandon the outline, continue to, you know, be a penster in that sense and then see where writing wants to take you? Now, if you're on the other hand, you know, if you are a penster, you struggle with outlining, you know that, um, all right, so I'm going to throw another uh, uh, fantastic, um, I'm trying to think who said that one. I think it's also, I think that one is actually from, I'm, I'm giving you another fantastic uh, uh, concept. I think it's from, I think it's from this one, writing for story from John Franklin. And he talks about, he calls it spaghetti. And it's not from eating spaghetti. It's from um, weather forecast graphs. <laughs> Um, so when you, oh, I'm admitting more people. Yay. So when you start writing, uh, it's like, you know how you can know the weather from today. It's easy for them to predict for tomorrow and they have a 10 day prediction, but that becomes kind of a little harder. And then if you go out, a, whatever, a month, you can't really know what the weather would be. Not for sure. Not in the same way that you know tomorrow. Why is that? Because there are so many data points and so many permutations that are involved in predicting the weather. And so spaghettiing is what starts happening to the graphs when you try to predict the weather too much out, right? You start and, you know, all the permutation happen and it, it's called spaghettiing. So John Franklin talks about if you do not outline your work and he's a Pulitzer, this is for uh, nonfiction, like serious nonfiction writers and he, he's a Pulitzer winning like he writes nonfiction, but, you know, like narrative nonfiction and journalism nonfiction, right? But still, he still talks about how do you, so that's another great book for, he really teaches um, from narrative theory, all the tricks and hacks on how to outline such a good book. We work with it in the workshop. Uh, and then you don't have to read the whole goddamn thing because, by the way, this one is really com complicated because then I walk you through it in a much more um, organized way, right? So this is a little bit of a, Big preview into uh, the, the second half of my workshop where we really dive into the style and the craft and the uh, uh, drafting and the stages and all of this. Um, so I hope this is not too confusing. I really wanted to give you like the overview of what kind of stuff we look at in this part. Okay, but also it's gonna be useful and I'm giving you all the books, you can go and read it. You don't have to take my work, workshop. That's not what this is about. So if you start spaghetti, right? So you start writing, and you don't have an outline and you you can get very, very lost in it, right? The spaghetti is like, oh, it's this. So what I am offering is a program that kind of brings both worlds, you know, the, the, the best of both worlds, like be a penster and be a plotter. And in fact, what I do with people is I find out if they are on the penster side of things, I encourage them to do some plotting. And if they're so entrenched in only, you know, doing outlines and they're not making progress because they can't execute the outline. The problem with executing an outline is that it's a rigid, like in our, in our anxiety a lot of the time, we, we create an outline and then we're too afraid to start writing because writing is always going to destroy your beautiful outline, right? When you come to execute the thing, you know, and you should not let yourself get stuck in execution of the outline. So please, you know, respond and, uh, you know, give me comments, etc. Even, you know, if live or if later, I would love to hear. And so this is, again, in a workshop, I would stop and have you write, are you a penster or are you a plotter? So those of you who are on here, I'm going to look at the chat to see if there is a, um, okay, I'm here. Oh, somebody saying, uh, Lovetti saying, I am a penster. I can outline to keep me on track, uh, but I free write, then put in some, uh, somewhere in the outline. Is that cheating? No, it's that's doing, that's, you don't need a workshop, right? Because you're doing it. That's my advice, in fact. There's no cheating. There is what works. And this is another big one for craft, um, you know, and that's, that's my, you, you guys are not going to be shocked to hear that my recommendation, the way I work with people is find your own best practices, you know, what works for me doesn't work for you. And what works for the both of us may not work for a third person. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the training that I offer is to learn to recognize the different elements that you need to get clear on in terms of what works for you or not, doesn't work for you. All right, let's go quickly back in. Oh, I, I forget to share. I just go into PowerPoint. Sorry, guys. So I'm going to share again. So the penster or the plotter, 
I'm just going to, I'm jumping over this. We don't have time for this. Um, so here's another, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, let, let me do this one. So here's an advice from another book, and this is from John McPhee. Uh, I'm giving you guys all the great books today. Sorry, I'm going to have another book, Avalanche. Draft number four, I don't know if you guys can see it, by John McPhee, another Pulitzer uh, winning journalist. Uh, this one from The New Yorker. And this is, this is, okay, guys, if you geek out on structure in style, you want to read this guy. He is, uh, he goes into structure. Uh, hang on, let me stop the share and show you. In his book, he has like, he talks about different stories he had written. And then he shows like the structure for one. Let me show you another one. There was one where he was driving with truck drivers across the United States. And he was trying to envision a, a structure for his story that would follow, you know, look at this. It follows the, uh, I think it's the one from the trucks. Right. So it follows the uh the course of their driving together, right? So he shows how he was trying to do for different pieces, coming up with structures that would reflect the thematic of the piece. So this is a really fantastic one if you want to geek out on structure and how to, you know, come up with innovative structures or, you know, out of the box structure. He talks about, I mean, I'm not going to have time to talk about, you know, uh, but I'll mention, right? So when we talk about structure, this is an important one, right? In academic writing, a lot of times, especially in the social and sciences, uh, more maybe in the humanities a little bit, um, we have this tendency tendency to fall on the chronology. You know, then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and that's that's what structures are writing, uh, and that's okay. But uh, in this book, as well as in my workshop, we talk on about how you then want to build, right? If this is your foundation. So, for example, my um, dissertation, book project, whatever it was, you know. I looked at a sitcom in the 80s, a reality show in the turn of the century, and then a uh, drama uh, um, for like, you know, these three, three decades. And in each decade, I zoomed in on the, on the genre of television. I'm a television scholar. That was the most popular global genre of its time. OK, so the sitcom in the 80s, the big kind of idol competition show in the turn of the century, and then the quality drama in the first or whatever, the second decade of writing the 20s, uh, our 20s or the teens, whatever, okay? So great, we have the 80s, the 90s, the whatever we call that decade, but I built on it, right? A, a second floor, sitcom, reality, drama, right? And on that, I built, a, there were so many buildings, it was, uh, I'm looking at Israel, right? So like this moment in history, I'm not going to go into like Zionism, post-Zionism, uh, back to fundamentalism, Zionism, that kind of thing, right? So the political context, everything thematically built on the chronology, but we didn't stay with this happened and then this happened and then this happened. But pay attention, you can stack these things up in structure. So that's just one example for if, and again, if you come to the workshop with your dissertation or your book project or an article, whatever, we spend time when we get to craft, thinking through, we invite you to bring your own project and tell us what the structure is. And we, we push and pull and we challenge you to think on how to structure the thing in a way that would actually reflect the brilliance of your argument, right? So these are the kind of things that we think about when we think about style. All right, let me see what else I wanna quickly uh, say. So, oh, the lead. So from uh, from uh, John McAfee, what I really wanted to ah, There you go, the book Avalanche is here. I, I knew it would come. All right, and we have thunder, so I hope we're not gonna lose power. So I wanna talk about uh, his idea of if you are at a loss, write the lead, right? So, okay, quickly. This is this is not to get you stuck on writing. The lead is the first paragraph of a, uh, especially of a news story, right? So his suggestion was, if you don't know what your story is about, you know, go outside, sit on a bench in a park or in a coffee shop or wherever, right? In a relaxed environment, and come up with two competing places to start, 
right? I would say in an academic paper, you know, do you have a story that you always tell, you know, when you go on a conference, you know, people come in and go like, my son did ask me that. And that made me think about my research question or, you know, some fun story from the history. You know, I would always use the one from um, the sitcom that I was writing about in the 80s, you know, starting with how this group of teachers and educators from the Israeli educational television traveled to Hollywood to spend that time on the set of Three's Company, which is, you know, was a racy sitcom at the time, to teach themselves how to uh, produce a sitcom. Because it's this story that, you know, uh, my American audience didn't know my Israeli sitcom, but they knew about Three's Company, right? So it was a really, they were like, oh, wait a minute, we tell us more about those weird educators going to teach themselves how to, you know, uh, produce a very commercial type of uh of a formula, right, for television. So you can go out and you can do, you can try two different stories and write the lead, write the story that kind of brings you into, right? And in an academic, remember topic, question, actions, in an academic setting, you tell a story that kind of conveys your topic and it conveys your question. And maybe it can even convey the actions that you're gonna take, right? So for me, I did an oral history of these people who traveled to Hollywood to teach themselves, right? So by telling that story, I presented the topic, I presented my question, right? So my question was, you know, what are we making of sitcom theory that is so embedded in capitalism and its modes of production? If we take this group of educators who were uh, working for an educational, national, non-commercial television, but decided they needed to do a sitcom for Israel, Right. So I was I didn't get in the lead into the fine grain of those questions, but the lead allowed me to invite people to actually ask themselves those questions. Right. If you do it just right, if you polish it just right, your lead can lead, (laughs) pun intended, your reader to already kind of mansplain to you the questions you have. Right. Because you make them think. It's their question because you tell them a story and the story brings up a question. So again, I am dipping into little tips and tricks on style, but that is also a craft trick. How is this a craft trick? Because it can help you get unstuck at the beginning where most people get stuck. You don't know how to start. Try two different stories. Learn from each one which argument comes out of that. Right. So if you're not sure, you know, if you're arguing, especially early on, you have so much. Ask yourself, what happens if I start in that moment in time in my research and I, you know, go and tell them that story? What question comes out of it? And then what action can I take to answer that question? But what if I, you know, again, if we go back to my uh, research, you know, what if I decided to start with the reality television show in the turn of the century? Right. And tell a different story of me going on the set and somebody is telling me something on the set. Right. Try, you can you can choose two, three different anecdotes from your research, ones that you often tell other people, and you can try to write out the lead. And in so doing, what it tricks you to do is you can find out more about um, the structure of the thing because, you know, we say writing has a plan, let it show you the plan. So writing the lead like that can really help you Um, learn what your writing is already planning for you. All right, so back to time real quick with this. So this is the writing the lead thing. All right, hang on. Oh no, I'm in the wrong PowerPoint, sorry about that. So trying to do both, I knew it was gonna get comical, but bear with me. Where's the time one? Sorry guys. Hang on, excuse me while I try to do this. Dang it. All right. Sorry about that. Trying one more time. Last time. Where did I have it? Just a second. All right. So I'm not going to go through this. I'm actually going to go through something else. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, what I wanted to, 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 to do was get back a little bit to time, but we kind of did that. Remember when we talked about the stages? So uh, remember from uh, Rosanne Bang, when I showed you the chart for product time, 
activities, right? Let me make sure I'm still on Facebook. Yes, I'm still on Facebook. All right. So remember the chart that I showed you, and she said for each uh, stage, right? Remember um, incubation, saturation, verification, uh, epif- no, sorry, epiphany. And then she told you what product time is going to look like. So I want you to go back there, right? To think about craft. And this is where you're going to bring together the question of how do I organize and plan over time? And what does it look like for me in my craft, right? And also you can bring into this the beginning time, middle time and end time. So my tip with time, with planning time, make a schedule for your week, but also for your month and your semester and your year. And be very concrete about blocking out what time goes for other activities and for your life and your well-being, right? And then find the number of writing days you have. And then, you know, the next step is, of course, deciding your goals, right? And if you know, and then, you know, you can kind of do a little bit of research. How long does it take you to write a chapter? Now, I will say, if you have a big project, please know that it takes the most to do the earlier chapters, right? When I was writing my dissertation, it took me two years to do chapter one, you know, a year to do chapter two, two months to do chapter three. I ran out of time. So chapter four, five, and conclusion, each was maybe, you know, a week and a half, a week, half a week, one night. I didn't tell you I was a, I, I had a practice. I mean, I told you I didn't have a practice early on in my career, right? So let's not try to do it that badly, but Still, you should know that earlier stages require more time. So if you know you have 50 days of writing and you have to finish that many chapters by the end of the year, or you at least want to, now it becomes a question of math, right? It demythologizes the planning um, by giving you a concrete set. So this is in terms of time. And then as you look through it, you can kind of do a, um, like a, a, a flow chart of where you think you're going to be in terms of the stages, right? So you're going to be in early stages and then you can plan to give yourself, you know, I actually give myself incubation time, uh, saturation time. Remember saturation is when you do the research and you get into it, et cetera, et cetera. Like when you do your planning, you can start, you know, saying in January, I will incubate. To incubate, I want to do this, this, this and that. You know, I want to go to the archive. I want to go to the museum. I want to take a nap. I want whatever it is, right? And then in February, I hope to be able to begin to go from saturation in my research into epiphany. So this is what I'm going to do in February. And then in March, I'm going to set up writing a messy first draft. And then in April, I'm just going to, um, you know, reread the draft and and make an outline for the final product, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we go into this in much more detail when we do the workshop, but uh, this is not the time. All right, what else did I wanna highlight for today? I'm just trying to jump around and give you like the best of the best of all of this. So, oh, I wanted to talk about finishing. All right, so let's, uh, okay, we're not gonna be able to do this, but I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna put it here. And if you're on Facebook later, uh, and if you're watching this on Zoom right now and we're not doing this right now, you know, you can take a screenshot uh, or you can go back later to the live on Facebook because it's going to stay there. This is a really fantastic workshop about finishing. Um, so we start talking about finishing, bringing something into completion. And so many people have this story, you know, I never finish things. Or, you know, whenever I finish, I don't finish strong or, you know, people have. So this is a little bit of a troubleshoot. Right. What is the story you carry around finishing, you know, for you to do in journaling? Again, if we had a workbook for today, that would be on the workbook. Is there a historic, uh, historically a triumph story around finishing or maybe more often a trauma story? Are you carrying post-traumatic stress? Like for me, I know that finishing my dissertation, what I've told you before, also I had a newborn. Right. So not only did I have less and less time, but I had a newborn and I already had a job and the job de- depended on me defending. So that's a trauma. All right. So is it about proving or failing to prove? Is it about remaining true to your conviction, standards and authentic expression? So, you know, so many times people don't finish and they have a story that, well, I can't finish because, you know, my thing needs to, to meet an impossible standard. 
right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not doing this right now, but I mean, you, you guys uh, hopefully are able to do it later. So here's another exercise I have around finishing. You know, what do I need to fill in the blank in order to finish? And again, you will see that the menu is very um, self-compassionate, right? What do I need to understand in order to finish? What do I need to accept, learn, give up, surrender, do or perform, execute, avoid, etc., to finish? So if, if your stuckness is around finishing, this is a very, very powerful uh, intervention for that. Um, all right, so this is another one. I'm giving this whole thing, so nope. All right. Um, hang on, I want to go into the other one. Sorry, guys. I am trying to give you as much as I can today, but so you, this one is a really powerful one if you are stuck on finishing. And finally, uh, oh, it's the same one. Hang on. Yeah, can't get that to the other one. All right, so I'll just, I'll just give this to you guys. Uh, finishing well. So finishing can be tender, where are we? Sorry, guys. All right, there. Finishing can be tender. It could be raw. It could be chaotic, right? It could be all of this thing, but it can also be exhilarating, uplifting, and fulfilling. So again, if you go back and you're writing stories about finishing, I think we tend to forget the triumphs, the times that we finished and it was fulfilling and it was uplifting and it was great. And we do remember the raw, tender, traumatic ones, right? Finishing can draw strength and power as well as, you know, the debilitating panic. And it can help you move past perfectionism and these ideals that you have about how perfect everything has to be and move down, kind of ground yourself in the world of what we call the manifested forms. And I think that might be a good place to, uh, you know, to end because today I promised myself I'm not going to go an hour and a half. So uh, I would be happy to hear any questions or comments. I know, you know, we couldn't get too much into the weeds with drafting because that actually also really has to do with your actual project that you're drafting right now. So if we talk about style and choices, but I think you got the sense of the kind of stuff we look at, you know, you want to understand the stages, you want to understand how to plan for a longer period of time by blocking out and seeing what you really have. You then can do the math. I have 50 days. I have a dissertation, you know, it should be that many pages don't do the thing where you like divide exactly by the days. Know that early on you need more time per page, right? So you can do that math. So that's in terms of planning. And then drafting and polishing and revising is all about the stages. Know that the early drafts do not, they don't need to look like um, the final product. So, you know, give yourself time and go to go through the stages and for your drafts to be exploratory, uh, Try the lead thing, the writing the lead if you're stuck early on. Uh, try to do the troubleshoot for your story around finishing if you're stuck at the end. Um, I hope that you guys keep, uh, I've been getting a lot of really nice, you know, emails and questions and keep coming to the group to Academic Writers and Block and to the challenge to ask me your question. If you have any questions on the chat, I'm happy to open this up at this point if you guys want to. Um, and... Um, yeah, I really hope to see a lot of you again, uh, if you can to get, you know, on the summer and the July retreat or in the accelerated course that again, I feel the, obliged to uh, mention again, just for 249, this is the cheapest I've ever been able to offer my signature workshop. It's an accelerated program designed for somebody who is maybe writing a dissertation or writing a book and they want to really finish this summer or, you know, you have another summer, but you want to make progress. You are trying, you are writing, you're making progress, but you also want to use this time to, um, you know, develop your writing practice. That's the name of the workshop. Develop your academic writing practice, craft, style, and process or I think process, craft, and style, right? And so this is going to be on an accelerated, self-paced, for the most part. You're getting the uh, pre-recorded lessons. Uh, there are, you know, maybe one hour a week that you have to watch a lesson. You're getting readings. You can read them. You can scan them. It's up to you. You can always, you get forever access. You can always go back and do a deeper dive later. And then you get, a, a you know, so this is four weeks. So you get on Monday, you get your lessons and your readings, everything, and you engage with it. And by the way, I'm going to give, it's all going to be there earlier on. So you will actually have time to get through this before we even start. We start after 4th of July. Um, so 
um, you get this on Monday and then there's a one hour workshop kind of like around the time that we did like one hour, one hour and 15, four times in a Friday uh, in July. And then by the time you finish this, you uh, have workshopped your own project and your own writing practice. And this is an accelerated minimum time investment, minimum uh, money investment on your part. I hope that you guys find this. Um, oh, and I'm going to put the uh, link, of course, here in the live. I cannot believe that we are done with our summer challenge. It's been accelerating and exciting for me. It's been really nice to hear all your feedback and your questions. Keep it coming. We're going to keep the recordings on the group, but not for much longer, maybe one more week. So if you have friends who have not yet benefited, uh, have them join. Um, have them sign up to get the free workbook and then they get the emails with uh, the replays and the replays are on the group. If you got the email with, with the replays, those are going to stay live longer. But on the group, I'm going. they're going to go away in maybe about a week. All right, friends. I uh, do declare that we are out of time for the summer challenge, but I absolutely am looking forward to hearing from you guys. Uh, you know, I do July workshops. I usually then do one in, you know, one in October, one around the end of the year, like December, January. Uh, oh, you're most welcome. I'm getting, th thank you for it. Uh, why, you know, Levette, you've been here all along, right? And then, you know, then I do one in July. So if it's working out for you this summer, fantastic. If not, I'll see you when I'll see you. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your summer and continue to write. I'm still going to be on the groups. So you can always ask me questions, uh, make comments, share your concerns, and have uh, friends in the group also help you out. And with that, I am bidding you farewell and happy summer of writing. <laughs>